It is finally official. Former Vice President Joe Biden is now running for President of the United States. I bet you didn't see that coming. In a three-minute campaign video released this morning, Biden cited the 2017 white nationalist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, as a turning point. Biden condemned President Trump's response to the violence. The president back then, you'll recall, said, quote, there were very fine people on both sides. President Trump is already firing off the insults on Twitter, writing, quote, welcome to the race, Sleepy Joe. I only hope you have the intelligence long in doubt to wage a successful primary campaign. So let's talk about all of this, Biden's run and some of the other stories of the day. We've got New Jersey Congressman Tom Malinowski. He is joining me at the table. Good to see you, Congressman. Good to see you. How are you? I'm good. Things are good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's dig right into it. Um, let's get we're going to talk a lot about foreign policy, but I want to get your take on Vice President Biden. I know that you in the past have supported and endorsed Cory Booker for mm -hmm. the 2020 nomination for president of the United States. But what do you make of the former vice president jumping into it? Well, I'm glad you asked because um, there's an announcement that I wanted to share with you personally today, and that is that I am not going to be running for president <laughs> of the United States. For a, a hot second there, I thought, man, I have not really been brief because 21 I've... is enough. What are we up to? 21, 22. 21 candidates running um, for the presidency. Well, I have endorsed my home state Senator uh, Cory Booker. Uh, I know Vice President Biden for my service in the Obama administration and before. I think we have an extraordinary uh, field of candidates uh, for the Democratic Party. Uh, most of whom I'm happy to say are running positive campaigns about what they believe our country should stand for and what they would do uh, if and when one of them uh, wins the White House in, in 2020. So I think it's good for the party, good for the country, and I look forward to the debate. What is it about uh, Senator Booker uh, that you like? I, I like his positivity. I like the fact um, that although he is passionately progressive about a lot of issues, he has been able to bring people on both sides together. The passage of the criminal justice reform bill last year, which is one of the few uh, major pieces of legislation that's actually passed the U.S. Congress in this time of partisan division with a lot of Republican support. And I think we desperately need that in the country now. All right, so let's switch gears. Uh, we've been tracking the latest fallout from the Mueller report. Uh, the president has vowed to fight all subpoenas. He's talking about going to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, let me get you on the record. Should President Trump be impeached? Um, I, I am incredibly disturbed by what I read in the, in the Mueller report, and I've now read most of the report. It, it, the good news is he wasn't working for Russia. The bad news is he wasn't working for America. This report paints a picture of a man who was only interested in one thing, and that was working for himself, and that is still the case today. Um, I think Mr. Mueller basically handed us the ball. We now have to do what past Congresses have done to fulfill our constitutional responsibility, and that is to take the investigation one or two steps further. There's a lot that Mueller did not cover that was beyond his mandate as he interpreted it, including the very important question of whether the president of the United States is compromised by his coordination with the Russians during the campaign. I think it's also, as we consider the impeachment question, we also have to remember our first duty is to be legislators. There are a lot of things that the Mueller report, the report brought out that cry out for legislation. For example, I think there should be an affirmative legal duty for candidates and campaigns to report to law enforcement when a foreign government uh, or other actor offers us help that would be illegal. Um, if you're a bank, you have to report suspicious transactions to the U.S. government. And yet a campaign can get an offer of hacked emails from Russian spies, and you don't have to report that. I think that needs to change. And, and I also think we have to tackle the obstruction of justice question. Mr. Mueller basically says in this report that Congress has the authority to ensure that a president cannot use his power in this corrupt way. That is an invitation to legislate, and we should take that up. Oh, some say it's an invitation to impeachment, so I just want to get mm -hmm. you clear on that. You would support impeachment, or you're not there just yet? I'm not there just yet. I, I'll tell you what my criteria are. Number one, did he commit impeachable offenses? Number two, is it in the best interest of the United States? I think the, my answer to number one is yes, clearly. We are way past the point when any Republican would have voted to impeach a Democratic president. I think we need to think very hard given the, the divisions in the country right now, whether proceeding in that direction is going to be best for the country. And I think we can, we can figure that out as the Congress takes the ball that 
uh, that Mr. Mueller passed to us and continues this investigation. All right, so let's talk about uh, this rejection by the White House to have uh, Stephen Miller testify before uh, the Congress. Uh, he has been the architect, some say, mm -hmm. of the child separation policy. Um, you're an immigrant yourself. I want to get your sense of the policies that have been enacted by this Trump White House and how they sit with you um, as an American citizen and as a member of Congress, but also this idea of co-equal branches of government. And there's always been a push and pull between the Congress and the office of the presidency, the executive yep. branch. But in this particular administration, there have been some 30 rejections of calls from the Congress to either appear or to provide materials to the Congress, and the president has rejected yep. those. How do you see, how do you square that? Every administration has fought subpoenas from time to time. No administration has said that we're just not gonna cooperate with the United States Congress. And frankly, this is a challenge to Republicans. Are they going to stand up for their institution, the House and the Senate? Are they going to set a precedent through inaction that future presidents can just say to hell with you to the United States Congress when we conduct our oversight authority? There may be specific cases where they might want to side with the administration. That's fine. I, I agree with that. But a blanket policy of refusing to cooperate with investigations, if that is allowed to stand, the United States Congress will not be able to fulfill its constitutional duties, not just under Trump, but under the next Democratic president. They should not want that. All right, let me ask you about this. You recently sponsored a bill condemning white supremacist terrorism mm -hmm. and the anti-immigrant rhetoric that inspires it. Uh, I'm just quoting here. Um, how do you, what's your take on what Washington should be doing to combat Islamic terrorism, we've been doing that. Mm -hmm. What about terrorism here in the United States, domestic terrorism? Well, we've been very successful in, in, in preventing uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, uh, foreign-based Islamic terrorist organizations, from recruiting people in the United States and committing uh, deadly attacks here. Tremendously successful. We have taken our eyes off the ball when it comes to white extremist, white nationalist uh, terrorist groups, which are increasingly transnational. Um, so number one, we've got to elevate uh, and give resources to the people in our government whose job it is to fight domestic terrorism. And that's something Congress can do, and I'm leading an effort to make sure we do that. We also have to watch our words, because the guy who walked into the synagogue in Pittsburgh last year and gunned down innocent Jewish Americans, and the guy who walked into that mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, they said exactly the same thing. They said they were acting to stop immigrants from invading our countries, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, Western countries. And on the same day as the Christchurch massacre, the President of the United States came out and said, immigrants are invading our country. If Barack Obama, on the day of an ISIS attack against a place of worship in the United States or another country, had come out and echoed ISIS propaganda, we would be up in arms against that. And, you recently, and we need to treat that rhetoric as incitement to violence. You recently tweeted, talk of immigrant invasions and asylum seekers as killers or animals mm -hmm. is not just factually and morally wrong, it's legitimizing and amplifying the rhetoric of people who are responsible for the majority of attacks in the United States today. Well, it is, abs it is absolutely true because this is the rhetoric that these terrorists use. And when our highest political leaders are using the same rhetoric on the same day as an attack by one of these groups, that should be absolutely unacceptable. We can debate border policy. If somebody wants to be for extending the border wall, I disagree with you, but you have every right to advocate that as a policy. But do not use this rhetoric of immigrants as invaders, as killers, as rapists, as dangerous to our way of life. It is absolutely not true, because immigration is what built this country. Immigration is what has made our country great. And it is now, as I said before, amplifying the rhetoric of terrorists who are responsible, this has been reported by everybody, responsible for the vast majority of terrorist attacks on us. Let me get your reaction to the comments that uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar has made in the mm -hmm. past that she's been criticized for, including by uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, should you, as a member of the Democratic Party and others, hold Congresswoman uh, Omar to the same standard that you hold Steve King when he says something that people find offensive. We, we did. We, con we condemned the leadership of the Democratic Party in the House, publicly condemned uh, her remarks. We then passed a resolution uh, the Democrats offered, the Democrats wrote, that specifically condemned the, the, the belief that 
Jewish Americans sometime, somehow have this dual loyalty, loyalty to Israel over loyalty to the United States. We did our part when a member of our party said the wrong thing. But then many people noticed that President Trump, a few weeks later, speaking to the Republican Jewish coalition. He's called Prime Minister Co Netanyahu. Your, your Prime, Prime Minister. Minister. Israel is your country. Right. And so thank you for asking me this question. But, but I hope you are asking the same question to members of the Republican Party in the Congress when not just a member of their ranks, but the leader of their party accused Jewish Americans of dual loyalty. Where is the resolution drafted by my Republican colleagues calling that out? One last question before I let you go. Uh, you spent many years at Human Rights Watch. Uh, I want to ask you about the, the relationship that the United States has with Saudi Arabia, an important mm -hmm. ally certainly in some of our geopolitical strategies around the world, but clearly a government that engages in human rights abuses on a regular basis. I mean, the Human Rights Watch would, would uh, agree to that. You're not there anymore, but I still talk to the folks there, um, mm -hmm. and they point out numerous human rights violations that have been committed um, in that kingdom. Uh, this killing of a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, who mm -hmm. was not an American citizen, but an American resident, a journalist at the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. The president, against all of the advice that he's been given from members of Congress and intelligence agencies, refuses to believe what they say, which is that they are fairly certain that Jamal Khashoggi entered that embassy in Turkey and was killed by the Saudis and dismembered on the orders of the Crown Prince mm -hmm. MBS. Um, what should our relationship, what, what kind of, what should we be doing with Saudi Arabia because it appears as if the president sees this as more of a transactional relationship and one not necessarily uh, based in our, our values. Yeah, he believes Putin over our intelligence community. He believes the Saudi crown prince over our intelligence community. That disturbs me even before we get to the human rights question. Um, th this, was, this was a man who was living in the United States. He was lured by the Saudis into an embassy and murdered on the orders of absolutely clear on the orders of the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. We can have a relationship with the country and with the people, um, but we're not going to forget or forgive this act. You do not do this to somebody who is under our protection in the United States. And so I've introduced legislation um, that would hold accountable anybody who is, uh, according to our intelligence community, responsible for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi by denying them the ability to visit the United States ever again in the future, unless the Saudis take some fairly serious steps to clean up their human rights situation at home. Um, I think this is going to have bipartisan support. There's, li there's similar legislation in the Senate that has Republican and Democratic support. This is the way in which we have to move forward, I think, consistent with our values and our interests. So you're a freshman member of Congress. How's it been so far? How does it feel? You're on the other side now. You were, you know, often at the Human Rights Watch and other uh, work for the Obama White House. I right. get that. But what's it like being a member of Congress after you've had to deal with <laughs> legislators for a lot of your <laughs> career? It, it's well, it's an extraordinary thing to uh, work in that beautiful place where so much American history has been made and to be there as an elected representative of 750,000 people in my congressional district. I have to answer to them, to represent them. And I, I, you know, I've been there for over 100 days. I pinch myself every day. I walk down on the House floor to cast a vote. Uh, and the day I stop pinching myself, I think, would be the day to, to leave and do something else. Congressman Tom Malinowski, thank you so much for stopping by. Will you come back and see us again? Of course. If you decide to run for president? Uh, ain't going to happen. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. You're on the record. All right. Thank you, sir. That was Thanks. awesome. Thank okay, you very bye -bye. much.